We're losing a sister this week too. She was truly a special person, always had a smile on her face. Justice will be served. It might not be tomorrow, it might not be a week from now, but the Creator has work and it'll come out. Faith Danielle Hedgepeth was born in Warren County on September 26, 1992. She was a member of the Haliwa Saponi Native American tribe and was born to parents Connie and Roland. She had three siblings, two brothers named Caleb and Chad, and a sister, Rolanda. Her parents divorced when she was a baby and she was raised by her mother and older sister. Faith adored her parents and her father Roland said she was the light of his life. Faith had been born at a difficult time in Roland's life when he had been battling addiction, and he said that her being born was the gift from God that gave him a reason to live. She was an honour student and earned herself a Gates Millennium Scholarship to attend the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, majoring in biology. Her father had attended the same university but had dropped out, and Faith was hoping to become the first person in her family to graduate from college. Faith had dreams of becoming either a paediatrician or a teacher and was described as lively, bubbly and always looking to give back to people in any way she could. She found the workload at university initially difficult, falling behind in some of her studies. Undeterred and refusing to give up, however, she started working two jobs to support herself, changed her major and threw herself back into obtaining her degree. She lived off campus in an apartment at Hawthorne at The View. She lived on the second floor, room 1502, and lived with her friend since first year, Karina Rosario. As well as living with Karina, known to most as Rosario or Rosie, Karina's boyfriend, Eric Takoy Jones, also lived there for a time. Eric and Karina's relationship was a volatile one and they eventually broke up and Eric moved out. He attempted to break into the apartment twice despite Karina changing the locks. Faith eventually drove Karina to court to obtain a protective order against Eric. This order prevented him from coming anywhere near the apartment. However, when he moved out, he moved into another apartment on the same complex, so was still living very close to the girls. September 6, 2012 started as any normal day. Faith attended all of her classes and then went to an event for Alpha Pi Omega. Alpha Pi Omega is the nation's largest and oldest Native American sorority and Faith was hoping to one day join. She left the event at 7.15 to continue working on a history paper about her tribe. At 8pm, she and roommate Karina went to the campus library for more studying. Faith briefly left the library, leaving Karina there, but returned at 11.30pm and both girls made their way back to the apartment at midnight. About half an hour later, they set off to a nightclub called The Thrill, arriving there at 12.40am. The Thrill was well known for letting in under-21s to dance and it became a popular student hangout. The girls danced for around an hour and a half before Karina said she felt sick and wanted to leave. She and Faith were picked up on security cameras leaving the club at 2.07am and Faith drove the pair home. Karina said when they got back she was sick due to drinking too much alcohol. A neighbour that lived below the girls recalled hearing banging noises just before 3am. She said it sounded like thumping sounds, almost as if a heavy book bag was being dropped or furniture was being overturned. Around 3.30am, records indicate that there was activity on Faith's Facebook account. Ten minutes later, at 3.40, a text message was sent from Faith's phone to the phone of Brandon Edwards, an ex-boyfriend of Karina. Some reports have suggested that Brandon was also romantically involved with Faith at one point, while others claim he was more like a big brother figure. The text message read, Hey B, can you come over here please? Rosario needs you more, aha. You know. Please let her know you care. Three minutes later, another text was sent from her phone to Brandon, and this one just said the word van. It is thought that Faith was correcting the word aha sent in her previous message, believing the meaning of the original message to be, Hey B, can you come over here please? Rosario needs you more than, you know. 
please let her know you care. Brandon replied to the message at 4.16pm the next day, asking who it was that was texting him, but he received no text back. Karina's phone records show that she had also been trying to contact Brandon Edwards at the same time. At 3.52am, another message was sent from Faith's phone. This one was to Ty Michael McNeil, Faith's on-again, off-again boyfriend whom she had known since the first day of college. An extract of the message read, I know you're probably sleeping, but I just wanted to let you know that I love you. This appeared to be the last activity on Faith's phone. At 4.25am, Karina got picked up by a friend, a UNCCH soccer player, Jordan McCreary, leaving Faith in the apartment alone. Karina said that she left the front door unlocked and believed that Faith was asleep in bed at the time she left. Jordan drove Karina to his apartment about five minutes away where she then stayed. The next morning at 10.30am, Karina phoned Faith, hoping to get a lift home. Faith didn't answer, so Karina called another friend named Marisol Rangel. Marisol picked Karina up and they headed back to Karina and Faith's apartment, arriving there just before 11am. Seeing Faith's car parked out front, they assumed that she had simply overslept and missed her classes. They entered room 1502 and began calling out Faith's name, to which they got no response. When they headed into the bedroom, they found a truly horrific sight. Faith's partially naked body was discovered on the floor, leaning up against her bed and covered in a duvet. Her t-shirt was pulled up and over her face and she had no clothes on from the waist down. The blood in the room was widespread, covering the walls, floor and wardrobe and a used tampon was found near her body. Faith had been bludgeoned to death and an autopsy later revealed that she had died from blunt force trauma to the head. Her face was covered in cuts and her body had been badly beaten. There were no signs of a forced entry and unfortunately there was no surveillance footage from around the complex to determine anyone coming in or out. Karina Rosario made the call to 911. 11.01 a.m. 44 seconds, September 7, 2012. Dara nine one one. Where is your emergency? I um I just like to sleep part in my friend just like to be unconscious. Okay, what's your address, ma'am? I live at Hawkeye at the view. You say your friend is unconscious? He's unconscious. I just walked in the apartment and there looks like there's blood okay, everywhere. Okay, listen to me. Okay, listen to me. Okay, I how how old is your how old is she? He's nineteen. Listen to me. Is is she breathing? I don't know. You need to check and see. Is she breathing? I don't think so. Okay, listen to me. There's blood everywhere. She's on the back, but like she, I think she fell off the bed because she's like off the bed. There's blood all over the pillows, like in the comforter. I just don't know what happened. Touch her arm. Tell me. Does she, how does she it's feel? She's not moving. Okay, ma'am, we need to find out if we can help her or not. Okay, kneel next to her and look in her mouth for she's food or vomit. Blood. Tell me something. Me. Listen to me. Listen to What is your name? Karina. Listen to me. When you touch her, how does she feel? She feels cold. She feels cold? Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Don't touch I anything can't. else, okay? Okay. What room is she in? She's in my bedroom. There's listen to in me. my room that, like, was not here before. Okay, it listen like to someone me. someone came in here. Okay, okay. It really does. Okay, tell me again what your name is. It looks like someone had been in there because she's okay. not like this at all. I don't know what Okay, okay. Is. Now, tell me again what your name is. What? What is your name? Karina Rosario. Karina? Okay, Karina. How old are you, Karina? I'm 
You're 20. You're 20? Okay, hon. Further analysis found semen on Faith's body, but it remains undetermined as to whether this was consensual or a sexual assault. The DNA from the semen also matched the DNA found in Faith's bedroom. A pathologist was quoted as saying, There is no gross trauma to the external genitalia, vagina or cervix on external examination with a vaginal speculum. Faith's family believes she was raped and Chapel Hill police believe that it was more likely than not that she was raped. A Bacardi rum bottle was collected as evidence. Tissue fragments and DNA were found on the bottle, and it was thought that this could have been the murder weapon. Next to Faith's body was a handwritten note, written across a time-out fast food bag. It said, I'm not stupid. Bitch. Jealous. Although the blood covered the walls and the floor, the note on the takeout bag was clean. This suggested that the killer had spent time in the apartment after the murder, washing their hands and cleaning themselves before writing the note. Even if the note was written before the murder, the killer would still have had to spend time cleaning themselves off before placing the note in the room. A handwriting analyst, Peggy Waller, said she felt the note was written with what is referred to as disguise, and whoever wrote it was deliberately attempting to change their handwriting. Chapel Hill's Chief of Police Chris Blue said that the murder rate in Chapel Hill equates to less than one a year, and Faith's death sparked one of the largest homicide investigations in North Carolina history. After months of very little news, we have new information tonight in the murder of a UNC Chapel Hill student. On one hand, there is new evidence. On the other, a profile of a possible killer. Julia Sims is here with the latest. Julia? Chapel Hill police tonight say they are confident DNA found at the scene will lead them to an arrest. David, police will not say exactly what DNA evidence was or where it was found at the scene, but they are confident it will lead them to Hedge Pest Killer. Faith's death sent shockwaves through the community and fear quickly grew among her fellow students. The university held a vigil, honoring Faith with a Native American ceremony. We're losing a sister this week too. And it hurts. She was truly a special person, always had a smile on her face. And you try not to question God's words or his work. But then again, you just want to know why. But justice will be served. It might not be tomorrow, it might not be a week from now. But the Creator has work. And it'll come out. Faith's mother Connie said that the family were unable to identify Faith's body and it would be two years before they found out about the note left at the crime scene or were able to read the autopsy report. All of the details surrounding Faith's death were sealed by a judge and they would remain sealed for two years despite being against Chapel Hill Police's usual policy. In November 2012, the university student newspaper, The Daily Tar Heel, petitioned the judge who had ordered the investigation records to be sealed. They wanted the judge to release an early search warrant in the case. However, the judge ordered that the records be sealed for another 45 days. At this time, two months after Faith had been killed, her cause of death had not yet been released to the public. Connie and Roland Hedgepeth told the media that their daughter's death certificate said that she had been beaten to death. In December of 2012, the FBI began assisting the Chapel Hill Police Department in the investigation, and they developed a profile of the killer. This profile stated that the murderer knew Faith and may have possibly lived close to her at one time. The FBI also believed that the killer may have been someone that took an unusual interest in the case, possibly talking to people about it and demonstrating behavioural changes. In May 2013, the court extended the seal of the evidence for a following 60 days. Also in this year, Alpha Pi Omega, the sorority that Faith had dreams of getting into, inducted her as an honorary member. In July 2014, the Chapel Hill Police Department released 300 pages of details about the case after a court ordered them to do so. The public and media were finally able to get some understanding of what had happened to Faith Hedgepeth that night and two months later, the autopsy report was released. It confirmed the same as the death certificate, that she had died of blunt force trauma to the head. She was covered in cuts and bruises to her body, as well as having blood under her fingernails. 
showing she fought hard against her killer. According to court records, search warrants were only issued to two apartments and they were both located at Hawthorne at The View. One was Faith and Karina's and one was in a separate building. Two sources have claimed that the woods behind Faith's apartment weren't searched and it was noted that the officers didn't search any other apartments on the premises, didn't go door to door and didn't bring sniffer dogs into the area. Another piece of potential evidence came from Faith's phone. On the night she was killed, she had called her friend Una Chavis three times and on one of the calls left a voicemail. Una said that Faith was notorious for accidentally calling people and leaving messages that she didn't mean to. The voicemail appears to be unintelligible. People close to Faith said they heard what sounded either like an argument or a fight between Faith and other people. Others hear what simply sounds like the inside of a nightclub at half one in the morning. Her father Roland said he hears his daughter in danger. TV journalist and newspaper columnist Tom Gasparoli started a blog and podcast focused on finding answers for Faith's family. He worked tirelessly to gain more information and share this with the public. He spoke to forensic audio analyst Arlo West and said, I thought he seemed very credible to me. His transcript I thought was pretty consistent, showing an anger and some sort of verbal assault. Arlo West is the president and CEO of Creative Forensic Services, certified in audio enhancement and has over 30 years of experience in the audio and film industry. He also specialises in pocket dial phone calls and believes he heard some notable things on the tape. He believes he heard four voices on the tape, two male and two female. The following transcript is what Arlo West believes could be being said on the voicemail. The timestamp shows the voicemail was left at 1.23am. This meant that Faith and Karina would have been at the thrill, and from the CCTV evidence, we know they left the club at 2.07am. By all accounts at this time, everything appeared to be okay. This timestamp has been disputed by some people, including Arlo West. He said, I found with the particular brand of phones Faith and Una had, both had issues with timestamping and voicemails being sent incorrectly at different times. The towers transmitting the cell phone signals were glitchy at best. I believe to a high degree of forensic audio certainty that that timestamp is incorrect. Chapel Hill Police agreed to look at West's enhanced audio version and evaluate it themselves. However, due to the timestamp of the message, police do not believe it to be a recording of the murder. Police said that the metadata associated with the call reinforces this too. Marks three years since a UNC student was found murdered in her apartment. While the case remains unsolved, the family has not lost hope. WNCN's Bo Minnick met with the sister of Faith Hedgepeth today, who says she's confident the killer will be brought to justice. Bo? Sean, Faith Hedgepeth would be celebrating her 23rd birthday at the end of this month. Instead, the 19-year-old was killed, found at a gruesome scene, and so far, no one has been charged. You couldn't be sad around her because she wouldn't let you be. She wanted you to be happy, and she'd do anything to cheer you up. It will happen. They're not going to get away with it. Hedgepest says police are working, but haven't been able to give her family any answers yet. There also is a scholarship in Hedgepest's honor called the Faith Smile Scholarship. It goes to Native American women entering their freshman year of college. 2015 marked the third year since Faith's death, and her family, friends and the community seem no closer to getting any answers. However, a year later in 2016, a sketch of the possible killer was released. Using genetic coding from the DNA at the scene, which acted almost as a blueprint, a company in Virginia were able to predict eye, hair and skin colour, freckling, face morphology and ancestry of the alleged killer. Each trait comes with a measure of confidence. 
Using this data, police and the laboratory believe that this could be the face of the killer, although this does not rule out anyone else being involved. According to the image, the suspect is very strongly Native American and European mixed ancestry, or Latino. Several people have been looked at quite closely in relation to the case. In the early hours of the morning when Faith and Karina were picked up on camera leaving the club, they were spotted walking out with a male. Police checked all the footage and saw that the man had arrived at the club earlier with three other men. They all later provided DNA samples, of which none were a match to the crime scene. Karina's ex-boyfriend, Eric Takoy Jones, was also a heavy focus of the investigation. He reportedly resented Faith for her influence over Karina and felt that she was interfering with their relationship. During a phone call, he allegedly threatened to kill Faith if he could not resume his relationship with Karina. Upon looking at Eric's phone, police found a text that he had sent to a friend. The text was asking them to forgive him for what he was about to do. This message was sent on September 6th, just the day before Faith Hedgepeth was killed. Police also found a similarly worded message to another friend via Twitter. Three days after Faith was murdered, Eric updated his Facebook to say, Dear Lord, forgive me for all of my sins and the sins I may commit today. Protect me from the girls who don't deserve me and the ones who wish me dead today. The police seized Eric's Jeep and searched his apartment, but said that nothing came up. Police described him as cooperative and said there wasn't enough evidence to arrest him and his DNA was ultimately ruled out of the crime scene. Eric told news reporters, From what I knew of her, she was the sweetest person in the world. If you needed her, she was there. However, although he was ruled out as a suspect, police believe that Eric does remain a person of interest, as even though the DNA did not belong to him, he may still know whose DNA was in the apartment and on Faith's body. Faith's father Roland has always been vocal about his feelings towards Karina. He said, I think that Karina knows what happened to Faith. Others have expressed their concerns regarding Karina's actions after the murder and about the 911 call she made that morning. People found it strange that not only was Marisol Rangel's name not mentioned, giving the impression that Karina was in the apartment by herself, but also that Faith's name was never uttered in the eight minute long phone call. Police said there were things that Karina needed to answer and clear up when it came to the 911 call. Questions as to whether or not Karina was giving the police all the information she knew and whether that information was entirely truthful. A downstairs neighbour walked into Karina and Marisol just minutes after they had found Faith's body. She said of the encounter, You would never have guessed the two girls had just discovered a crime scene. Certainly a murder. I will never forget that. Marisol was softly crying. Karina was texting. Just texting. People also found it questionable that Karina wanted to leave the club and go home due to feeling unwell, to then exit the apartment just hours later, leaving the door unlocked. The man that picked Karina up that morning, Jordan McCreary, had a roommate who had spoken to the investigating team on the 2018 review of the case. The roommate recalled a conversation being had about a potential speck of red on Karina's clothes when she arrived at the apartment that morning. The roommate said that the police were aware of this and searched the apartment for Karina's shirt. The Chapel Hill police confirmed this account. They said they tested the shirt, but this test was not indicative of Karina committing the crime. They also did not confirm whether the red speck was blood or not. Private investigator Hunter Glass has been working closely with Faith's family, and he also feels that more answers lie with Karina. He believes that an argument between the girls ensued at the Thrill nightclub, possibly to do with jealousy over dating or a relationship, which may have led to Faith's death. Karina Rosario moved out of North Carolina and hasn't spoken publicly about the case since. Roland Hedgepeth said she no longer takes his calls. Police sources have said that whenever they have made contact with Karina, she has been cooperative. One of Faith's old roommates, Kira, said that Faith was speaking with her high school sweetheart, Alex, at the same time she was dating Ty Michael McNeil and seemed conflicted about the relationships. Kira said that there always seemed to be some sort of drama with Ty and described him as having obsessive behaviour when it came to Faith. She said that Faith had told her Ty had once pushed her into a wall. Faith's friend Una Chavis, who had received the strange voicemail that night, 
attested to the same controlling behaviour, and said that Faith had told her that Ty had hit her. Ty was spoken to as part of the 2018 review of the case, and said that he had texted Faith on the morning of September 6th, the evening before she was killed. He asked her if she wanted to hang out later, but he received no reply. It wasn't until around 3.52am that he got any answer from her phone. Ty believes that this was Faith texting him, but her father Roland isn't so sure, and doesn't think this is how his daughter would normally type. Una agreed and didn't feel it was how Faith would talk either. Just days before Faith was killed, she had spoken to Una about wanting to resume her relationship with her high school sweetheart Alex, and this just didn't match up with what she had written in the text to Ty. Ty did have an alibi for the night of the murder, and he submitted a DNA sample. However, he said he doesn't know if he was given the all clear by police, or if he simply just didn't hear back from them regarding the sample. Decorated police sergeant Derek Lavassa and a forensic psychologist Chris Mahandy were part of the team on the 2018 look into the case. They spoke at length about the theories and people that may have had some potential involvement. Chris Mahandy said, There's at least three or four people here that should be considered strong persons of interest. Eric Takoy Jones, Karina Rosario and Ty Michael McNeil the odd social media posts and the texts from Eric, the threats he had already made towards Faith, alongside the fact he lived very close to the women. Derek Lavassa discussed a theory that Eric Takoy Jones may have brought someone back to the apartment with him, someone that wasn't as familiar with Faith, and that is potentially who the DNA belongs to. It would have meant that this person may not have been tested yet, because they are removed from Faith's social circle. The strange behaviour seen from Karina on the morning Faith died, and the volatile and, according to friends, abusive and controlling relationship that Faith had with Ty. The pair found it odd and concerning that Ty had downplayed the tension and volatility in the relationship, and they also spoke about the text message sent from Faith's phone at 3.52am. Chris Mahandy described the messages as way out of context for what was happening in the relationship at the time something that Roland Hedgepeth and Una Chavis both agree with. Although nothing can be said for certain, the pair spoke about the lack of microscopic or trace evidence left outside the apartment. Derek Lavassa said, You know how you could leave that apartment without leaving a single piece of trace evidence? You're not in a rush. He went on to say, Who would take the chance at staying in an apartment that wasn't theirs to write a note and stage a scene unless they knew nobody was coming back. Karina's the only person who would know definitively that no one else was coming to the apartment at 4.30 in the morning. She's the only one. Unless there was somebody else there with her, it's possible. The pair, alongside many others, believe Karina probably knows more than she's saying, but they do go on to discuss the seeming lack of motive. If Karina was involved... Why on earth would she commit such a crime against someone who was like a sister to her? Ultimately, investigators do not feel this was a random opportunistic crime committed by a total stranger. They believe it was carried out by someone in Faith's circle and was likely someone she knew through university. Over 2,000 people have been interviewed so far, either as suspects or people with potential information, but nobody has ever been charged. The DNA found at the scene has been compared to hundreds of samples, but sadly, none have been a match. Police say this doesn't entirely eliminate anyone though, as someone may know who the DNA belongs to, or may still be involved with Faith's death somehow. Faith's family are offering a $40,000 reward for information that leads to the arrest of the person or persons responsible for Faith's murder. Faith's legacy continues to live on with the Faith Hedgepeth Memorial Scholarship, the scholarship is offered to help Native American women enter higher education. When I found out that I was a recipient of Faith Smile Scholarship, I was honored. I was so overjoyed because not having the means to go to school is a big thing in our Native American communities. The murder of Faith Hedgepeth remains an open and active case. The Chapel Hill Police Department welcome any information that anyone may have. Alternatively, you can leave a tip where all calls are confidential. I've left links to these numbers and further resources in the description box below.